A boat acceleration graph can be a very useful diagnostic tool for analyzing rowing technique. This graph shows the boat acceleration curve for a double skull rowed by the brother and sister team of John Alexander and me, Julie Alexander. We've been racing at World Masters events for the past 15 years and have won numerous gold medals. The data for this graph was obtained using the free phone app called Crew Nerds. The phone was taped to the rigor of the boat to collect the data and then the data was downloaded into Excel and then into MATLAB where I generated this graph. The relatively smooth curve was obtained by averaging over 18 strokes, all having a stroke rate of 27. The graph begins at the catch and ends back at the catch. The quantities graphed here are time on the x-axis and acceleration on the y-axis. It doesn't matter what the units on the y-axis are since it is the shape of the curve that is important. The first thing to notice about this graph is that the acceleration is positive during some parts of the stroke and negative during other parts of the stroke. The definition of acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. This means that if the acceleration is positive, the boat is speeding up. And if the acceleration is negative, the boat is slowing down. There is no way to eliminate the negative acceleration during part of the stroke because the rower has to change his direction relative to the boat. This requires that the rower exert a force on the boat that tends to slow the boat down. It is useful and somewhat encouraging to compare our acceleration graph to that of the Olympic champions. The graph on the bottom shows the boat acceleration curve for the Olympic champion lightweight men's double in red and a typical national level lightweight men's double in blue. Both crews are rowing at a stroke rate of 35. It can be seen that our graph is similar to the Olympians graph in the sense that it has two peaks during the drive phase, whereas the national level team's graph only has one peak. The two peaks is a common feature of boat acceleration curves for the fastest crews. The basic principle of rowing is quite simple. Momentum is transferred to the water by the oar, causing the water to move in one direction while the system moves in the opposite direction. Although the blade appears to lock on in the water, it must move the water in the opposite direction to the motion of the system in order to conserve momentum. The rowing system as a whole includes the rower, the boat, and the oars. The rower's mass accounts for about 80% of the total mass, the boat's mass accounts for about 15%, and the oars make up the remaining 5%. The only external propulsion force acting on the system as a whole is the force of the water pushing on the end of the oar. The exact interaction of the oar with the water is quite complex. It involves hydrodynamic lift forces, vortex shedding, and components of forces that are not parallel to the boat's velocity but these details are beyond the scope of this discussion. Opposing the motion of the boat are resistive forces known as drag, which appear in three forms, skin drag, form drag, and wave drag. Skin drag, which is due to friction between the boat and the water, accounts for about 80% of the total drag forces. For this discussion, I will neglect all drag forces on the boat. Excluding these drag forces will not significantly affect this analysis. The forces generated by the rower result in the displacement of the total rower boat or system. The motion of a rowing cell is, shell is complex because of the relative motion of the rower within the boat. All forces between the rower, oar, and boat are internal to the system and occur in equal and opposite pairs. Notice that each force within a pair acts on a different component of the system. The action of the rower pulling on the oar results in the reaction of the oar pulling on the rower. These pairs of forces cancel each other out and do not contribute to the motion of the center of mass of the rower boat or system. There are action-reaction pairs of forces at all contact points between the rower, the boat, and the oar. Remember, it is the force on the water on the end of the oar that moves the boat. It is the oar that allows the force applied to the handle by the rower to be translated to a force applied to the water by the end of the oar. The oar is acting like a second-class lever with the pivot point located on the shaft at different locations depending on oar angle with respect to the boat and depth of blade in the water. Since the data for the acceleration graphs comes from an accelerometer attached to the boat and not the rower, I'm going to focus on the forces that cause the acceleration of the boat to change. These are the forces that are directly affected by the rower's technique. The force of gravity on the boat and the buoyant force due to the displacement of water balance and can be ignored for this analysis. The effect of the movement of the rowers in the boat cannot be ignored when analyzing the acceleration of the boat. I'll discuss this when it becomes a significant factor for interpreting the shape of the boat acceleration curve. 
The first force that affects the boat acceleration directly is the force on the foot stretcher due to the rower pushing on the foot stretcher. This force is perpendicular to the foot plate. Since the foot stretcher is typically at an angle of 45 degrees, the foot stretcher force has a horizontal component and a vertical component. The reaction to the vertical component of the downward force on the foot stretcher is a force up on the rower. It is this upward vertical force on the rower that reduces the effective weight of the rower on the seat during the drive. The apparent weight of the rower can be reduced by as much as 80% at the beginning of the drive. The horizontal component of the foot stretcher force is the force that contributes to the acceleration of the boat. If the rower is pushing on the foot stretcher, then the force on the boat is toward the stern of the boat and tends to slow the boat down. If the rower is pulling up on the foot stretcher, then the force on the boat is towards the bow of the boat and tends to speed the boat up. There is also a horizontal force on the boat that acts at the gate. This is the reaction to the gate pushing on the oar. This force also has components that are not parallel to the boat's velocity, but the important component for this discussion is the one that almost always points toward the bow of the boat. It is the net force or vector sum of these two forces that determines the acceleration of the boat. Net force is calculated by subtracting the forces to the stern from the forces to the bow. The goal of the rower is to generate and coordinate these forces using a minimum amount of energy to move the boat as fast as possible. Understanding the boat acceleration curve will help to achieve this goal. In order to relate our acceleration time graph to our rowing technique, I used the free open software called Canovia to capture still images from a video of us taken from a coach boat. Now analyze in detail John's and my acceleration curve and discuss how our technique affects the curve. The force vectors due to my motion are drawn on the boat. These are the gate force and the horizontal foot stretcher force. There is a similar set of forces on the boat due to John's motion that I haven't drawn. The blue arrow on the acceleration graph indicates the time during the stroke where the image was captured. The graph begins at the catch. The catch begins when the blades just start to enter the water. Our weight is on our feet, therefore we are pushing on the foot stretcher and exerting a force towards the stern of the boat that tends to slow the boat down. This results in a negative acceleration at the beginning of the catch. As the blade enters the water, there is a small force on the gate that further slows the boat down. You can see that the acceleration becomes even more negative due to this slow blade entry. In order to minimize this effect, the blade should enter the water cleanly, smoothly, and quickly. I think we could improve our entry of the blade into the water by relaxing our shoulders and arms more at the catch and just letting the blades drop into the water. As we start the drive, we pull on the handle, generating a force on the gate towards the bow of the boat. We also push on the foot stretcher, generating a force towards the stern of the boat. Initially, the force on the foot stretcher is bigger than the force on the gate, so the acceleration remains negative and the boat continues to slow down. The best crews will have a deep but narrow negative peak during this part of the stroke. This is accomplished by having a good connection between the feet and the hands and pushing quickly off the foot stretchers so that the body weight is lifted off the seat. The fact that our curve is not very steep indicates that we are not suspending our weight between our feet and hands and we are not holding the body angle established at the catch during the first part of the drive. When the gate force equals the foot stretcher force, the acceleration of the boat is zero. In our case, this phase of negative acceleration takes 10% of the total time of the stroke when we are rowing at a rate of 27. The Olympic double takes only 7% for this phase when they are rowing at a rate of 35. This phase of our drive is taking too long because we are lifting our shoulders at the catch before we drive with our legs. Our legs are much stronger than our upper body, so we need to use them more to increase the force on the gate more rapidly. As we continue with the leg drive, the force on the gate is larger than the force on the foot stretcher, resulting in positive acceleration. The boat is finally speeding up. This is for two reasons. One is that our legs are in a strong position where we can exert the most force on the handle, and the second is that the blade is at a more efficient angle with respect to the boat. We reach the first drive peak 12% after the beginning of the stroke. This is the same timing as the Olympic crew, but the positive portion of our curve is much shorter than theirs, Therefore, the change in velocity of our boat would be much smaller than theirs. The height of the first drive peak is strongly related to stroke rate. Rowing at a low stroke rate often doesn't produce this peak at all. As the stroke rate increases, the peak starts to appear. The best crews usually have a very high first peak, often just as high as the second peak. 
You can see that we have a first peak, but it is not nearly as high as the second peak. I think this reflects our overall leg and core strength and our fast twitch muscle capabilities. It takes strong legs to push quickly off the foot stretchers at the catch and a strong core to translate that force to our hands. Working to improve our strength should result in a higher first peak in our boat acceleration curve. After the first peak, there is a gap in the curve where the acceleration of the boat is close to zero. This is where the acceleration of the rower's mass becomes an important factor in the boat's acceleration. Up until this point in the stroke, most of the power generated by the rower has gone into accelerating the rower's mass, not the boat. If the rower's center of mass moves towards the bow more rapidly than the center of mass of the whole system, then the boat reacts by moving towards the stern. This is why the acceleration of the boat drops to nearly zero. This is also why, in general, we want to minimize the horizontal distance the center of mass of the rowers travel with respect to the boat during the drive. I think this is why you no longer see excessive layback at the finish in winning crews. Although our, our acceleration curve doesn't dip below zero, if negative values of the acceleration appear in the gap between the peaks, then a multitude of things could explain it. Disconnection of the legs and trunk due to a weak posture of the low back, double trunk work where the trunk opens early in the catch, causing a dip in the trunk velocity, or sinking the blade too deep in the water. The second peak in the acceleration curve occurs after the leg drive is over and the trunk and arm start to increase the handle speed. There is no longer a force on the foot stretcher slowing the boat down and the rower's center of mass is not moving very much toward the bow. This results in the maximum acceleration of the boat due only to the gate force. Our second peak occurs at 32% of the total stroke time. This is too late in the stroke. Olympians typically reach their second peak after only 28% of the total stroke time. I think we could improve this part of our stroke by increasing the acceleration of our hands towards our bodies after the leg drive is finished. Also making sure there is pressure on the handle right through to the finish will increase the size of the second peak in the acceleration curve. At the finish of the stroke, the boat's acceleration once again drops to zero. But this time it is because there are no forces acting on the boat once the blades are out of the water except the drag forces. If we were to stop all movement at this point, the boat would just coast to a stop. However, this is not the case. As we move our bodies up the slide towards the stern, the boat reacts by moving towards the bow. This is due to conservation of momentum and is also the cause of the surge of the boat towards the bow after the blades have been extracted. Obviously, extracting the blades cleanly on the square will prevent the boat from slowing down. Our acceleration curve doesn't drop below zero, so we can assume our finishes are pretty clean. The bumpy part of the graph is during our arms away and rock over. I think the bumps are a result of the two of us not swinging out of the bow together or perhaps not extracting the blade at exactly the same time. This part of the curve should be as smooth as possible so as not to disturb the run of the boat. Holding our legs down longer while we rock over will help to smooth out this part of the graph. The bumps in the acceleration curve indicate that there are rapid changes in the velocity of the boat. Although this might be only a small effect, in general, we want to minimize the variation in boat speed during the stroke. This is because the power required by the rowers to maintain a constant velocity depends on the cube of the velocity. So if you want to double the boat velocity, you need eight times more power. This also means that if you want to maintain an average velocity of four meters per second, it takes less power to travel at four meters per second for the entire stroke than it does to spend half the time at three meters per second and half the time at 5 meters per second, i.e. large variations in boat speed cost energy. The next small positive peak in the acceleration curve occurs during the recovery when we pull up on the foot stretchers. This causes a force towards the bow and tends to speed the boat up. The transfer of our mass up the slide also causes the boat to move towards the bow. Once again, it is important as a crew to be together on this part of the recovery. You can see that I'm behind John, however, this asynchronicity doesn't seem to cause too many bumps in the acceleration, acceleration curve. The acceleration once again reaches zero during the recovery when we change from pulling on the foot stretcher to transferring our weight onto the foot stretcher, which is like pushing on the stretcher. When the foot stretcher force towards the stern just balances the force towards the bow due to our motion up the slide, the acceleration is zero. After this point, the force due to our weight on the foot stretchers causes the boat to have negative acceleration and thus slow down. 
This is the part of our stroke that needs a lot of work. We spend much too much time in the top quarter of the slide during the recovery. John is always telling me not to hang around at the catch, and now I know what he means. Frame by frame goes by, and the boat continues to slow down. As we hang around in the top quarter of the slide, I sky my blades and start to dip my shoulders rather than maintaining the tall body position established earlier in the stroke. We need to work on relaxing our upper body during this top quarter, pulling our feet under us, and then just dropping the blades into the water without reaching too far forward. The boat continues to slow down. Finally, we're back at the catch. Adding the time when the acceleration is negative on the recovery to the time it is negative after the catch gives us a total time of negative acceleration that is 30% of our total stroke time. This is sometimes called the catch duration. An Olympic crew typically has a catch duration that is only 22% of the total stroke time. Our goal will be to reduce our catch duration by working on the top quarter of the stroke during the recovery. We need to spend less time with the weight on our feet during the recovery, even if this means rushing the catch and checking the boat. I think it is a common misconception that pulling up quickly on your feet in the top quarter is not a good rowing technique. Based on our acceleration curve, our boat should go faster if we do this. We'll have to try it. Another interesting quantity that can be used to analyze rowing technique is the relative velocity of the boat during one stroke. This is the green curve on the graph. Relative velocity is the area under the acceleration curve and the reference velocity is the velocity of the boat at the beginning of the stroke. In this case, the velocity of the boat is the same at the beginning of the stroke as it is at the end of the stroke, indicated here by the fact that the green curve starts at zero and ends at zero. You can see that the relative boat velocity decreases when the acceleration is negative just after the blades enter the water, and that the boat speeds up the entire time the acceleration is positive. The velocity of the boat is actually a maximum during the recovery. At a low stroke rate, this maximum velocity occurs at the finish, but at higher stroke rates, the maximum velocity occurs closer to the catch because of the rowers pulling up on their feet. In our case, the maximum velocity occurs at the same time the acceleration of the boat is zero during the recovery, and we are beginning to transfer our weight to the foot stretcher. The check factor of the boat is the difference between the maximum relative velocity and minimum relative velocity. It will be interesting to see how our check factor changes if we rush the top quarter of the slide. Based on my analysis of this acceleration curve, my recommendations for improving our technique to decrease the time our boat is slowing down during the stroke are decrease the time to translate the foot stretcher force to the handle by holding the body angle at the catch and trying to lift our weight off the seat. Decrease the time in the top quarter by pulling up on the feet more quickly. It is unproductive to try to minimize the boat check. Decrease the time to get the blades in the water by sitting up taller and not dipping the shoulders and arms just before the catch. Thanks for listening. I hope you learned something about the physics of boat acceleration curves for rowing shells. If you have any suggestions or feedback about this video, feel free to contact me.